everyone. So I was traveling last week for a conference, which meant I had to miss out on some of the excitement of the JDVST image release. But of course, I am still really excited about it. And I hope you are too. And I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, I probably won't go into too much detail about the actual images because I think by now you've probably seen them and heard about them, but just a very quick recap. We have this beautiful image of the Southern Ring Nebula, which is a planetary nebula. There's a binary star in the middle here and the white dwarf is actually the one causing the planetary nebula. Now you can't really see the white dwarf in the mirror cam image, but in the mirror image, it glows red because it's surrounded by dust. I think that's so cool. This is beautiful. It was beautiful with Hubble and now we have just even better visuals on it and it's it's really great. We also got this spectrum of an exoplanet's atmosphere with just really great resolution through the infrared. This planet was actually chosen partially because it didn't have clouds in its atmosphere based on previous spectra in the um, shorter wavelengths, but it actually turned out once they got this data, yeah, there are clouds and water. I mean, this is a hot Jupiter. Well, it's more like Saturn mass, so this is not like a habitable exoplanet in any way. It's also hot, very, very hot, but this is still just really cool. And I cannot wait to see how JWST continues to look at exoplanets. And who could forget this quintet, Stefan's quintet. So these five galaxies appear together as a cluster in the sky, but four of them are actually physically interacting. This spiral galaxy in the upper left is actually a, a foreground galaxy, which in this image, look, like you can see the stars in this galaxy. It's so pretty. <laughs> also, you can see this arc of material here that's actually coming from these galaxies colliding. Then we have the absolutely gorgeous Carina Nebula. This is the cosmic cliffs of dust. This was seen in Hubble and now we've got an even better view, of course, with JWST. This is breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking. And last but certainly not least, we got this deep field image of SMAX 0723, which is a galaxy cluster core. That means there's a ton of mass here, and so that mass is actually bending space-time, allowing light from further away galaxies to be magnified into our view. This image really makes my brain short <laughs> They like to describe this as covering up an area the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length on the sky. And look at it. Look how many freaking galaxies there are in it. It's amazing. There is so much to love about this picture, but I actually do have a favorite. I picked this one as my favorite and I nicknamed it Dali. <laughs> Okay, so these are the beautiful new images that JWST has brought us, and it's continuing to bring us more because the telescope is out there taking new data all the time. But a question that I get asked a lot and what I wanted to talk about today in this video is just how we get these beautiful color images from the James Webb Space Telescope. So most of these images came from NearCam. There is some MIR in here as well, but let's talk about NearCam, which is the near infrared camera on JWST. So light coming into this telescope hits the primary mirror, which is those 18 beautiful hexagonal segments. The mirror reflects and focuses that light onto the secondary mirror, which is the one that's held out here on the struts. Then that mirror reflects and focuses the light into the instruments, including NearCam. Now NearCam actually has two duplicate sets of the entire optical instrument. Now these look at two different patches of sky, although patches that are right next to one another, but other than that, they're identical. So let's just look at one of these optical instruments. So when the light comes in, it's actually split into two segments, a short wavelength and a long wavelength band, and this split happens at 2.3 to 2.4 microns. Now for any telescope, if you're trying to take data, you need some way to record that incoming light. And these are the detectors. In the olden days, that would have been photographic plates, but nowadays it's more like a digital camera, often using a similar detector called a CCD or charge coupled device. JWST though actually doesn't use CCDs. It uses a very similar thing called a mercury cadmium telluride array. And I certainly am not going to get into the details of how this works, but this is what it looks like. It's basically a square of pixels and each pixel can count the number of photons that hits it. And for NearCam, that's 4 million pixels. The detectors are 2000 pixels on a side. But since the detector is just counting photons, the data that you get out from that is just going to be black and white. It's basically going to be how bright is each pixel. Enter filters. So a filter goes in between the incoming light and the detector so that only photons of a certain wavelength can get through. 
These are all the detectors that are equipped on NearCam. So this top row here, don't worry too much about, those are basically just blocking filters, but you can see there are many filters of three different kinds, wide filters, medium filters, and narrowband filters. And there are filters for both of the wavelength channels. Remember I said the light was separated by dichroic into these two wavelength channels. Now these filters are not random, they are chosen for certain wavelengths for certain reasons. The wideband filters are just so-called general purpose filters, and these are a lot of the light that you're going to get that are going to eventually give you those color images. These medium band filters let in a little bit less light, but they're not narrow to a specific wavelength. They're generally used for things like looking at cooler stars, brown dwarfs, planets, and certain molecular emission lines. Now these narrowband filters are chosen very specifically for certain emission lines. For example, F164N is chosen to look at a particular transition of iron 2. The 164 means that it's centered at 1.64 microns. While 212N and 470N are both chosen to look at different emission lines from molecular hydrogen. Okay, so going back to our black and white data that we're getting from the detector. If there is a filter in place, then we know what wavelength range those photons must have. And color is all about wavelength. So the visible spectrum of light, which is at shorter wavelengths than what we're talking about here, basically bluer light has shorter wavelengths and redder light has longer wavelengths. This is why infrared, which is the region of the spectrum that JWST looks at, is called that because they're at wavelengths a little bit longer than red wavelengths. On the other side, you get ultraviolet because it's at wavelengths that are a little bit shorter than violet. So for a telescope that takes data in the optical range, this could be really straightforward. You could assign colors to each filter based based on the colors that we actually see with eye. And this would give you something called a natural color image. Now, although natural color images do correspond to what our eyes can see, they don't necessarily mean that's exactly what you would see if you were somehow floating up in space looking at that object, because telescopes have a lot of abilities that our eyes just don't have as light collectors and detectors. But conceptually, it's like a one-to-one -one mapping. However, even in visible wavelengths, you don't always want to do that because sometimes you're trying to highlight certain features, like these narrowband emission lines, you might want to make them stand out. So there's lots of different false color palettes you can use. Now for JWST, because it doesn't even see light that is visible to our eyes, if it tried to do a natural color image, it would just be black. Well, actually, that's not true. There is a tiny, tiny sliver of red that is visible light for JWST, but okay, the vast majority of it. <laughs> is not detectable to our eyes. This means that all of the JWST images are false color. Now this is not trying to mislead anyone, this is just how we have to translate information to make it useful to see. Okay, so they have all of these filters to choose from, and they can assign light from a given filter a certain color, and then stack all of these images on, on top of one another to get a composite image that is in beautiful full color. Now there's a lot of choice about what filters to use. So this is going to be basically chosen by what looks best. So we're talking about making these full color images that are going to be released for the public. These images are art. These are meant to be looked at, they're meant to be appreciated, they're meant to be seen and to illustrate the beauty of the universe. Scientists are usually working with the raw data from the FITS files that's in black and white. They might use the filters for scientific purposes, but not usually to make images like this. This is kind of more on the engagement side of things. Now, while they could choose pretty much any color for any filter, they usually do try to use a kind of sorting that is similar to visible light. So the shorter wavelength filters will usually get a bluer color, while the longer wavelength filters will get a redder color. This doesn't mean though that it's like a one-to-one -one mapping of like, oh, just add 100 nanometers or something and shift everything into the visual. There's definitely going to be, you know, some artistic choice here. So let's look at the beautiful Southern Ring Nebula from NearCam as an example. Now this picture is available on the telescope's website. We can see, as usual, the beautiful final result, but this image also lists at the bottom all of the filters that were used to create it and the colors that they were given. In this case, they used two wideband filters, the 090W and the 200W. So these kind of cover opposite sides of the spectrum so that we get the short wavelengths here, which they colored in blue, and the long wavelengths, which they colored in this yellow. And they used four narrowband filters here, F187N and 405N are both excited hydrogen lines, and 212N and 470N are both lines of molecular hydrogen. Now again, when combining all of these together to create this final image, it isn't just a give it a color, slap it together. There's going to be artistry involved here, choosing the exact shade, the exact strength of each filter to make the picture as good as possible. For another example, we can look at the beautiful cosmic eclipse of dust in the Carina Nebula. 
And again, the filters that they used are listed at the bottom of this image. There are six, but they're not the same six. So this time they used three wideband filters, including 444W, which is a bit longer wavelength wideband. They used two of the same narrowband filters, one for the excited hydrogen at 187N and one for molecular hydrogen at 470N. And in this image, they also used a medium band filter. This one is a slightly longer wavelength, that 335M filter. And this actually is good for looking at methane and something called PAH or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. <laughs> okay, I said we were mostly going to talk about NIRCAM, and we have, but let's talk quickly about MIRI or the mid-infrared instrument. So MIRI does not have the two wavelength channels. There's no dichroic for that. And there's only one type of filters. They're all wideband filters. So these are the nine wideband filters that can be used with MIRI. But other than that, it's the same idea. So you can see this image here of the Southern Ring Nebula, gorgeous again, uh, using MIRI, and this time you can see the four filters that they used and how they chose to colorize them to create this image. Now I mentioned that scientists usually are working directly with the raw data in something called a FITS file, but it's not just scientists because this is publicly available data. So there's something called MAST or the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes. And so if you wanted to, you could download this data yourself and you can actually play around with trying to colorize images yourself and see what you might come up with and how you might do it differently than the team did it at NASA. And you can edit these using something called DS9, not this kind of DS9, it looks like this. So if you're going to look for it, I suggest throwing like an astronomy search term in there for Google, otherwise you'll get a lot of this. <laughs> Actually, should I? Should I do it? I should do it with you guys. I have not used DS9 since undergrad, like more years ago than I care to admit. I'm not an observational astronomer at all. I've never even downloaded anything from MAST, but like, it might be fun. Okay, I'm like kind of, t let's do it, let's do it, let's go. Oh, maybe I should make this another video. Okay, come back and look at the next video where I try and see if I can do this myself. We don't know how it's gonna go. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. I hope you are loving these GWST images as much as I am, and I will see you guys again soon. Bye.